this video is going to be talking about a principle in statistics which is really important and one that students tend to have a lot of trouble with, which is measures of spread. Remember that one of the things we talk about when we try to summarize a set of data is its variability. And our measures of spread numerically are the way that we summarize that. Most students have a very good grasp on the idea that when we talk about the center of a distribution, we're talking about the mean, we're talking about the median. The problem is a lot of people don't think about, well, how do I measure variability and what is it really telling me if the median is a certain, or if the quartiles are a certain number or if the standard deviation is a certain number. So this video is meant to help explore some of that. We're first going to talk about the mean-based <clears throat> measure of spread. So when I talk about a mean, it's kind of got a partner that's going to describe the spread, and that's the standard deviation. This one tends to be a little tricky for students to understand. And I think a big part of why students don't understand it is because it looks really scary, and it seems like the number comes out of nowhere. The formula for it is actually uh, pretty complex when you first look at it, but it certainly simplifies itself later on. Because remember that the formula looks something like this from your book. It's got this summation notation, and basically it just looks like a real pain. In class, you may remember that we computed a standard deviation by hand to try to see if we could demystify this formula a bit. We first of all took a very small data set. We calculated its mean, which of course in the formula goes here. We then took each data value and subtracted the mean from it. And those parts, when you put those together, hang on one second here, when you put the parts together, this part of the formula in here is called the deviations. And so a standard deviation is simply trying to say, overall, on the average, what do the deviations look like? We square those deviations to eliminate the negatives. We sum them up. We divide by n minus 1, not n. And that might seem like an odd, uh, an odd thing to do. It might seem like, well, if we're averaging, why don't we divide by the number of data values that we have? Um, that has something to do, certainly, with the idea that if we make that number uh, a little bit smaller, we're going to leave the average of the deviations just slightly larger which is going to give us a little bit more of a wiggle room, fudge factor type of thing. But also, remember that these deviations, if we just simply added them all up, they would add up to zero. And we found out that just comes from the definition of what a mean is. Um, in other words, that very last deviation, in order to make all the deviations add up to zero, each deviation can be whatever it wants to be, but the last one has to be whatever would make the entire list of deviations add up to zero. The last deviation can't be anything it wants to be. It has to be a certain number. And so that leaves us with um, n minus 1 degrees of freedom. This is a concept that we're going to come back to in second semester and expand upon for the moment, not the most essential thing for you to wrap your head around. We take the square root in this formula simply to undo the process of squaring that we did earlier in the formula. So this is the standard deviation, but okay, what does that mean? Well, remember that on the average, what we're trying to do, if I say that, for example, x bar is 10 and s is 2, I'm trying to get an idea for a given data set, how far are most of the values from the average? How far are most of the values from the average? So if my s is 2, then I would say that there are many values in the list fall between 8 and 12. Probably more than half are going to fall between 8 and 12. And that's useful to know. That would give me a good idea of where they would fall. If I change my standard deviation to, say, 4, well, that would tell me that most of my values would actually fall, in that case, between 6 and 14. That could be very useful for me to know, even just knowing those two numbers. I don't even have to have the entire list of data. Later, what we're going to see as well, when we start looking at normal distributions, 
is we can say what percent of the data we expect to fall within one standard deviation of the, of the average, within two standard deviations of the average, and within three standard deviations of the average. So this standard deviation is going to tell us where many of the values are going to fall. We saw this in class with an example where we said that we could see that it was something like only a handful of, of data values fell outside of a standard deviation. There were just a few of them. Definitely it was something like three quarters of them fell within a standard deviation of the average. So that's really what it's useful for. On the flip side, let's say I'm using a median and I've got my five number summary. What does that tell me and what could I use it for? Now you, I assume, know how to calculate a five number summary. So let's just talk about what you might do with it. Remember that the interquartile range, or IQR, is constructed by taking the difference of Q3 minus Q1. A couple of important things to remember here. A lot of you have made the connection that this distance is the length of the box in a box plot. The trickier part to really get your head around is to remember that this box contains exactly half of the data. Now that may be if you have an odd number of numbers in your list it actually contains slightly more than half um, but it basically contains the middle 50 percent. That can be very useful because it can tell you a lot about what's going on in the center of the distribution. So anytime you want to talk about not just the median itself but what's that middle half of the data doing? This interquartile range is extremely valuable for that purpose, especially if you're trying to look at a distribution and get an idea of its attributes. Keep in mind, I'm going to draw a box plot on here. If I've got a box plot like this, and let's say that it's for a skewed distribution. I know this distribution is skewed because my box is not centered inside the whiskers and because the median line is tilted over to the left. A tricky concept for students to really realize is that if I talk about how much data is in each one of the sections of this box plot, well, it's exactly the same amount in each part. So for example, 25% of all the data observations fall in this range right here. One-fourth of all the data are accounted for in this range. One-fourth of the data are accounted for in this range as well. One-fourth are here, and one-fourth are here. That might seem odd because in our brain we tend to say a longer interval should have somehow more data in it, but it doesn't. All we know is that this section, these data, this 25%, are more spread out as compared to, say for example, this 25%. These are closer together. And when I say closer, of course it's closer compared to what? Well, compared to this other quartile here that's in this area. Okay? So this set of data are closer together. So you'd see more values perhaps repeated or they just would have a smaller gap in between them. Here, <clears throat> you'd see more spread in between the data, okay? These are really important things to know about these measures of spread as you're considering how to use them in statistics.